Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming and welcome to our session about the Australian climate case. Um, if you're not on mute, please pop yourself on mute um, just so everybody can hear. And we, I just want on Uncle Paul to join and I think he's just joined now. Um, hi, Uncle Paul, you might be on mute. You might have to unmute your phone if that's you. Um, okay, so we'll just get started. So um, thank you so much for joining us today. So we've got, I hope an amazing lineup for you to inspire you um, to go forward and bring a climate litigation against your governments. Um, so we're joined today. Hi, Uncle Paul. Hi, hello. Hello, welcome. Um, so we've, We've got a few different people on the line who I'll introduce. So we've got um, Uncle Pabai. Uncle Pabai, can you wave for everybody? So Uncle Pabai is a, a Gudamalagal man and a traditional owner of the island of Kuwait in the Torres Strait. Uncle Pabai has five daughters and two sons, and he's lived on Boyagu his whole life. He is a director of the prescribed body corporate that represents the six clan on the island. Uncle Paul says that, um, sorry, Uncle Pabai says that Boigu is extremely low lying. The highest point is about three meters above sea level and it makes it very, very vulnerable to flooding. The flooding is getting worse because of climate change. And as a Boigu man, Uncle Pabai has specific responsibility to protect sacred cultural sites um, on Boigu and on surrounding islands. And the, but the rising sea is making that really difficult for Uncle Pabai, and it could mean that those islands disappear forever. Loss of those places would be devastating for the Gudamalagal communities and for generations to come. And that's why Uncle Pabai is bringing this case because it's his cultural responsibility to protect his community, culture, and spirituality from climate change. That's Uncle Pabai. He's got his beautiful um, totems behind him. Um, so you can see those, the crocodile and the yam. Um, we've also got Uncle Pabai, who has joined us on the phone. So, uh, sorry, Uncle Paul, who's joined us on the phone. Um, Uncle Paul Kabai is a Gudamal Legal man as well. He's a traditional owner of the island of Saibai, which is next to Boigu. He's also a director of the Prescribed Body Corporate, which represents seven clans on his island. He has two daughters and six sons. And Uncle Paul's family has lived on Saibai for more than 65,000 years. Uncle Paul says that if People from Saibai become climate refugees and lose everything, homes, community, culture, stories, and identity. He says that we can keep our stories and tell our stories, but if we're not connected to country, um, because it will disappear, it will affect who we are and our identity. He says that's why he's taking the Australian government to court, because he wants to protect his community before it's too late. We've also got um, Brett Spiegel on the line. So Brett, can you wave for everyone? Um, so Brett is a senior class action litigator with 20 years of legal experience, and he has a commitment to bringing justice to those hurt by corporate malfeasance. Brett's a qualified lawyer here in Australia and also in the United States, and he's prosecuted complex and challenging cases in the fields of public health, mass tort, institutional abuse, the environment, shareholder claim and shareholder claims and he's achieved over 400 million dollars in judgments and settlements which is huge um, he's done Australian class actions including um, some claims in Manus Island Brooklyn Greens Fairbridge Farm School and a number of other um, class actions including this very case here um, in addition to his experience in Australia um, Brett um, has also worked as a trial lawyer for the US Department of Justice. Um, so in America, where he worked on la the landmark case of the US versus Philip Morris, the tobacco company. Um, and he's also been a counsel to the US Senate Judiciary Committee. We've also got the wonderful Maria Nawaz, who's going to wave as well. Um, Maria is Grada's acting executive director. She is a human rights lawyer. She's got expertise in strategic litigation, human rights, and discrimination law and women's rights. Maria has previously worked as a lecturer at UNSW Law School, as a solicitor at Kingsford Legal Center, and in the human rights team at Legal Aid New South Wales, and as a legal officer 
at the Commonwealth um, Attorney General's Department. So she's also got a lot of experience as well that we hope she can share with you today. Uh, so those are our wonderful panelists. Um, but before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the country um, that I'm on today. Um, so I am on the Aboriginal land of the Dark and Young country, um, which is just north of Sydney. I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that this always was Aboriginal land and that it was never ceded. I'd also like to pay my respects to Uncle Paul and Uncle Pabai um, and the elders on Boigu and Saibai Islands. And I'd also like to pay my respects to um, elders um, and community leaders across the Pacific as well. Um, so before we get into the um, the questions for the panelists, I just wanted to give you a quick overview of the Australian climate case. So people in the Pacific, um, you would know that Australia's response to climate change is one of the weakest in the world. It's been e extremely disappointing. Um, if the federal government doesn't change course, even with the new government and fast, the islands in the Torres Strait could become uninhabitable. Um, that would mean that Torres Strait Islander communities would be forced to leave their homes and that would be severing more than 65,000 years of connection to land um, and culture, and that would make them Australia's first climate refugees. The experiences of people in the Torres Strait are very similar to people living in the Pacific, um, whose calls on the Australian government to do more to protect your island homes as well have also been largely ignored. Australia is often referred to as the big brother in the Pacific. And as a big brother, Australia must do more to protect the island homes and communities of people in the Torres Strait and also the Pacific. Uncle Paul and Uncle Pabai's case, which you'll hear about in detail during this discussion, is the first time anyone in Australia has argued that the whole Australian government, not just one minister or agency, has a duty to protect people from climate harm. If Uncle Paul and Uncle Pabai are successful, they won't just be protecting their communities, they'll be making all of us safer from damaging climate change. Uncle Paul and Uncle Pabai have turned to the courts in the hope of protecting communities from disaster. And they are arguing that the federal government has a legal responsibility to ensure that Torres Strait Islander people aren't harmed by climate change. In legal terms, this is called a duty of care. Uncle Paul and Uncle Pabai will argue that by failing to prevent climate change, the Australian government has unlawfully breached the duty of care because it will um, sever and create lasting because of the harm that it will create to the, um, to the communities if their connections are severed. The exciting thing about Uncle Paul and Uncle Pabai's case is that they are seeking an order from the court which would require the government to prevent this harm to their communities by cutting greenhouse gas emissions in line with the science. And that's something that is important to communities all around the world. So just to get started, um, Uncle Pabai, can you tell us a little bit about your island of Boigu, where it is, um, how it's made up, how close to the sea it is? Uncle, Uncle Papa, you might just need to go off um, mute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, 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 good morning. Uh, before, I, uh, before I go any further, um, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to pay my respects to acknowledge and recognize the traditional owners as a custodians of the land, that way we work together with the community of Boigo Island. We pay our respect to the Torres Strait and to the community of Boigo Island, ancestors of the land. their spirit and their legacy. I like to acknowledge the land to share with us this morning where I'm speaking from, from the elders past, present and emerging and to my people 
the voice that I will share on behalf of my community. It is very well known and said on behalf of my community and my people. I'd like to share a bit about Boigu, my home community. Boigu Island is the most, most northerly inhabited island of the Queensland in Australia. It is a part of the top Western group of the Torres Strait. The mainland of Papua New Guinea is only a five kilometers away, away from Buigu. Buigu Island is a low laying island that has an area of 86.6 .6 kilometers of square. And it is approximately 18 kilometers long. Boigo Island is surrounded by mangroves. And Boigo Island is always the most important island from all the Torres Strait Islands in the areas. Boigu is very well known to me. I born to Boigu. I born to this land. This is why it's very important to me to share the story about Boigu to all of us around the world and to the Torres Strait, to hear what we are facing today. Thank you, Beth. Thanks, Uncle Pabai. And Uncle Paul, um, you might need to go off mute when you're answering this question, but can you tell us about Saibai? You might just need to press on your phone unmute. Uncle Paul, when you do unmute, just interrupt and then we'll get you to answer the question when you, you do do that, okay? Um, so, Uncle, I'll just come back to you, Uncle Pabai, while Uncle Paul's on. Oh, here we go. Uncle Paul, Uncle Paul tell us about Saibai Island, please. Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Belinda said, my name is uh, Uncle Paul. Uh, I'm born and bred on Saibai Island in Torres Strait. As Uncle Pabai say, Saibai is, uh, say, most... Uh, Northern Islands uh, of Australia, Torres Strait, which says, uh, not says, which uh, is Missouri border, just lie between us. And so now we close, we are to Papua New Guinea. And uh, Saibai, just to tell you a little bit more about Saibai. So Saibai is a uh, alluvial uh, sediment deposit from uh, uh, Playa River. And uh, Saibai is just about uh, 1.7 meters above sea level. Uh, 1.7 uh, meters, it's scary for us because uh, uh, the, the, the level is rising, seawater level is rising. We are the most northern, northern islands in uh, uh, the Torres Strait. 
The island is most covered with swamps. And uh, uh, we are uh, living on uh, just a narrow strip of land, which is about two to 300 uh, meters, or maybe seven, 800 meters. This is our, uh, our strip of land we, 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 we develop on Saibai. So, uh, yeah, uh, all, 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 this, this uh, 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 strip of land, we got, we said we, we got infrastructures like uh, community center, primary school, telecom tower, uh, uh, you know, uh, airport. We we all, that's all. Uh, uh, infrastructure was built on uh, that narrow strip of land. So uh, yeah. So the main problem is uh, Uncle Paul, can you tell us about um, what's happening to that infrastructure with climate change and also about the gardens on your island as well and growing food, how that's changing? Okay, we look at climate change, what, what's been affected like before. My ancestors and uh, my grandfathers, they didn't take notice about the climate change or the global warming or the, the sea water level was rising. And we used to, we used to, there used to be a, a fresh water in the swamp. We used to gather and um, uh, uh, canoe, Paddle canoes to our garden beds. And now there's nothing. Swamps is all covered with mangroves. And you're looking at our fossil. It's all eroded. Before we have nice white sand, but now it's all gone. We used to have uh, gardens next to our houses. So we can't make any gardens next to our houses anymore because there's too much salt coming in. Inundation happening during monsoon season. Big changes happening here on the island. Thanks for sharing that with us, Uncle Paul. Um, I know that that's a hard thing for you to do. Uncle Pabai, could you tell us a little bit about what you're seeing on Boigu Island and what climate change effects um, are happening? Yeah, thanks, uh, Bill. Yeah. Uh, the climate change is a very important weapon to our communities. What does climate change make a change to your communities? What does it in impacts the whole communities. Before the days, we don't have climate change. We have a beautiful community. That way we live. Now back in the days, our ancestors, they believe, when they believe, this won't happen to our community because of the belief. Now belief, they have been changed when they have been impacted by the climate change. The whole structure has been changed to giving us the worst community that we are when the climate change had been take place. Now this has been destroying the community, the inland of community, everywhere. Our seabeds has been destroyed by the climate change. The sand has been moved right across on top of, of the muddy place. 
that's impacting our crabs, our barramandis, our turtle and dugongs. When, when I'm saying the sand has been moved, it's damaging the seabeds, also for the turtle and dugong. The sand has been damaging the mud, also for the crabs and the barra, barramandis. Now for the community area, it's been damaged from the west, sorry, from the east to the west of my community. When the heroes not been take place, the both end of the community will be, it's, it's sinking down. Now I know for a fact, I've seen that, I've seen those area where which area has been impacted. Damaging our homes, our gardens. We, at this time, we have no way to go because we've lost everything at this point of time. Now, I believe that the government is saying that we're going to upgrade your houses. We're going to lift them up, lift your houses up from the salt water. But it's not, it's not like that. They can do that, but it's not happening. And now I see in my community, we are still facing. And we are waiting for the most disaster plan of what we are about to see and what we are about to acknowledge and see what happens. Thank you. Thanks, Uncle Pabai. Um, okay, so um, we have a new government in Australia, which I'm sure you would all be aware of. It's a government which is a little bit better on climate action, but I'm just going to hand to Maria. Can you tell us about the new Labor government um, here in Australia and what its position is on, on climate policy? Sure, thanks, Val. And sorry, I've got a bit of construction in the background, which I hope you can't hear. Um, so yes, we have a new federal Labor government and there has been a change in tone from government on climate policy, but this case is really about one thing, what is enough to prevent climate disaster in the Torres Strait? So the Labor's Climate Change Act, which passed earlier this year, does mark a change in terms of Australia's approach to climate change, but unfortunately the commitments in that law are not enough. Um, they're proposing to cut emissions by 43% by 2030, but if islands like Boigu and Saibai, where Uncle Papai and Uncle Paul are from, are going to remain habitable, then we need to limit global temperature rise to below 1.5 degrees. And for Australia, what the experts think that means is Australia needs a 74% cut in emissions by 2030 and to achieve net zero by 2035. So what's la what Labor's offering just isn't enough to achieve that and it's not enough to save the islands in the Torres Strait. Thanks, Maria. And um, Brett, can you tell us a little bit about Uncle Paul and Unc Uncle Pabai's case? What is it about and what um, does the case allege the Australian government is doing? Thanks, Belle. Um, so Uncle Pabai and Uncle Paul's case is essentially saying that the Australian government owes them a, a duty of care to take appropriate steps in relation to climate change. And uh, as, as Mario was explaining, and as uh, uh, Uncle Paul and Uncle Papa were talking about, what we're seeing already is, is creating all kinds of climate issues in Boigu and Saibai and throughout the Torres Strait. And that if we stay on the track that we're currently on, we will face disaster and Uncle Paul and Uncle Papa will lose 
65,000 years of, of island custom, of, of their culture and their islands. And what we're saying to, to the Commonwealth of Australia is that you need to look to the science when you're making your decisions. And you need to make decisions in respect of the Torres Strait and in respect of climate that will appropriately consider what's going to happen to the Torres Strait and what's going to happen to Uncle Pabai, Uncle Paul, and other Torres Strait Islanders. And it isn't okay for them to ignore the actual science and pick and choose and rely on other science, which uh, they use to justify inadequate goals. If they don't change, it will have catastrophic impacts on, on Torres Strait Islanders like Uncle Paul and Uncle Pabai. And, and that's what the case is about. Thanks, Brett. And um, I'm going to come to you in, in a minute, Uncle Paul. So um, if you can just unmute, but I'll first I'll start with you, Uncle Pabai. What would losing Boigu mean to your culture and your identity? Hey, thanks, uh, Ben. That's one of the very important questions. Like I said, we are the people of the culture. Our identity cannot be removed. Our culture cannot be removed. Now, this is very strong advice <laughs> that I will say that culture is a very important weapon for us to be recognized that who you are. We have the culture in every way to believe from the land to the sea, to the surrounding area of the island and to where you were born. Those are the most, in, most important keys that we need to hold on to it. If we will lose our identity, our culture, I will say that I won't have anything behind my back. I won't have anything to say that way I am from. <clears throat> because, of, because of the role that we play, that I was taught from our ancestors, we never ever lose our culture. We hold on to our culture. If we lose our island, we will lose our culture, our identity, to believe that who you are and to believe that where you come from. If the island goes underwater, you will have no background of your character. <clears throat> you can be just a person that who you are. The person will take you nowhere because you don't have anything behind your back to support you. To say that we are the people of Buddha Malunga. Yes, we have, we have our own cultures. We connect together. We families together. From Saibai, Duan, Boigu, we are Buddha Malunga nation. We based on the same lingo language. We based on the same culture. That we are the people of the nation. That we believe in our traditional knowledge to the world. Thank you. Thanks, Uncle Pabai. And Uncle Paul, can you tell us um, what losing Saibai would mean to your community and to your, your kids and generations to come. We just need to go off mute.
just jump in Uncle Paul when you um, come off mute and we'll make sure you can answer that question. Or you might just need to press it on your phone. Um, so while Uncle Paul is um, sorting that out, um, Brett, can you tell us what a legal victory would look like for Uncle Paul and Uncle Pabai? What, what would it look like and what would the Australian government be forced to do? So what Uncle Pabai and Uncle Paul are, are seeking is uh, primarily injunctive and declaratory relief. And what that means is that it would require certain things to be acknowledged by the government and would require certain steps to be taken by the government. And essentially what it would do it would force the government to follow the science in protecting Boigu and Saibai. And along with it, a lot of the rest of Australia and islands in the Pacific is, as as Mario was referring to previously, the levels of emissions cuts simply aren't enough to protect and save Oigu and Saibai and a number of other island nations. If this case prevails in the best possible outcome, you would have an injunction which require the government to follow emissions targets, which actually would keep uh, climate change and increase in temperature to 1.5 degrees. And that would be enough to save the Torres Strait Islands and, and, and prevent some of the, the worst effects of climate change from harming Uncle Pabai, Uncle Paul, and, and, and many of the rest of us. Uh, thank you, Brett. And Uncle Paul, please jump in when you um, unmute. Um, so obviously, the Australian government reducing emissions is one important thing that needs to happen, but we are working... Um, we are in a part of a global community and there are lots of countries who are also contributing emissions that they need to stop. Um, so Maria, Uncle Paul and Uncle Pabai's case is one of about 80 cases um, around the world that are being taken against governments for their failure to protect people from climate action. And a lot of these cases were inspired by the Dutch case, which was brought by an organization called the Agenda Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about that case and how it transformed climate in the Netherlands? Thanks, Belle. So um, we're also working with Agenda on Uncle Paul and Uncle Pabai's case, which is really great in order to get their really vast experience in this area as well. Um, so the Agenda case was filed against the Dutch government in 2015 by the Agenda Foundation, but also 900 Dutch citizens along with them. And they sued the government to require it to do more to prevent global climate change, essentially. It was a really successful case. It was the first case in the world where a court established that a government had a legal duty to cut its greenhouse gas emissions. In that case, it was a 25% cut by 2020 based on 1990 levels. Um, in that case, the court found that the Dutch government's pledge to reduce emissions by 17% at the time was insufficient to beat their fair contribution towards the UN goal of keeping um, global temperature increases within two degrees. And it also ruled that the Dutch government must immediately take more effective action on climate change to avoid catastrophic climate harms in the Netherlands. So it was a huge win. It was appealed by the Dutch government, but the highest court um, eventually found in 2019 that the win was upheld. And so the Dutch government was forced to urgently and significantly reduce their emissions. Um, it was really game changing. It had a transformative impact on Dutch climate policy. So the Dutch government now has some of the strongest climate policies in the world. It's closing coal fired power stations and investing billions in renewable energy. In 2019, the government um, passed a new climate change act, which was held as the most progressive in Europe at the time. Um, and that case is really a great example about of how litigation can force governments to act when governments are ignoring advocacy or other tools. Um, and it's inspired many similar cases around the world, as Belle said, including the Australian climate case, which is being led by Uncle Paul and Uncle Pabai. Um, thanks, Maria. And so we've just had a question. So can you please repeat um, what the um, 
advice from other organisations is on the reduction of emissions for Australia um, and how and whether or not the order specifies how the Australian, like if we were to succeed, how if the, an order would specify how the government had to achieve those emissions. And Brett also jump in. Sure. So um, the experts at the Climate Council have calculated that Australia would need a 74% cut in emissions by 2030 um, and to achieve net zero by 2035 to give us a chance of staying below 1.5 degrees of warming. And I'll pass to Brett to answer the second part of that question around how the order is framed. The, the way that the case is structured is that we're not trying to tell the Australian government how it needs to meet these targets. We're simply saying these targets are the scientific targets that need to be achieved. And so whether that's done via increases in uh, different green energies, whether it's done by the closing of coal-fired plants, whether it's done um, through other measures, that part would ultimately be left to the government itself to determine. But the idea would be that the injunction itself, if granted by the courts, would say that these targets, because they are the scientific targets required to save the Torres Straits, are ones that must be adhered to in order for the government to meet its duty. Thanks, Brett. Okay, if um, anybody has questions as well, we might just start to work through them. So please pop them into the chat. Um, if you're in a room, I can see two rooms, raise your hand and um, we'll try and come to that as well. Um, so while people are typing up questions, Uncle Pabai and also Uncle Paul, if you can come off, just please just um, start talking so we know that you can hear us. Um, but Uncle Pabai, what do you hope the impact of your case will be for Pacific Island Friends? Yeah, I'd like to, uh, Bella, thank you for that. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to welcome all the uh, Pacific Islands uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, I know that uh, this, this, this climate uh, change has been uh, impacted uh, all around the world as well. And for example, uh, uh, the brothers and sisters uh, uh, I like to give my own benefit uh, for the for the brothers and sisters, uh, you know, uh, we'll be will be working together and we'll be uh, really good to uh, to go to a connection uh, with our brothers and sisters in helping in any other ways that uh, that uh, we can, you know, to uh, uh, trying to uh, stop this uh, climate change. Uh, 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 in, to help families as well. In uh, I I uh, I will uh, put my hands up to. Uh, Helping in 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 ways that uh, uh, for the brothers and sisters, yeah. Thank you very much for that, uh, Bill. Yeah. Thank you, Uncle Pabai. Um, so we've got a question from the Vanuatu Hub. So Brett, I'm going to get you to answer that one and another one at the same time. So the question is, what sort of injunction are you seeking? Can you please elaborate on that further? And after you do that, could you please also explain the time frame for the case and key dates as well? Sure. In terms of the injunctive relief, we're seeking different cascading injunctions. And so one of the injunctions at the outset require the government to conduct appropriate research on the best available science on the Torres Strait and on impacts there. The next level would be looking at what levels of uh, greenhouse gas emissions are required to save the Torres Strait. And we say the, uh, the climate authority has already done this. And then lastly would be an injunction that would actually require the government to meet the emissions to set and then meet the emissions target. There's also declaratory relief that would be sought, which would include the recognition that the government does owe an ongoing duty of care to Pabai and Paul and two Torres Strait Islanders in relation to climate change. In terms of the case itself and uh, the timetable for it, we are moving quickly to trial. 
The judge fortunately has recognized the urgency of the case and the need for it to be heard quickly. And so her honor has set down the case to be heard in June. And in June, it will be fact witnesses and the court's actually going to be going on country and taking evidence on Boigu and on Saibai and um, actually hearing people on their land. And we hope that that will have a very profound effect on the court. And then the court will hear expert evidence in either October or November. And we are hoping would then render a judgment either in late 2023 or early 2024. Um, thank you, Brett. And so, um, Maria, um, how can people stay updated about the case and how can they get involved? Because um, we've obviously got this hearing coming up in June next year. It's going to be a really important time for us. It will run for about four weeks. Um, so can you please explain that and um, ways that we'll be looking for support and to so also to use our case to support our, um, our friends in the Pacific? Thanks, Belle. So if anyone's um, keen to stay updated on the Australian climate case, you can sign up to Uncle Paul and Uncle Pabai's mailing list. So if you go to the website, it's www.australianclimatecase.org.au and we'll also put that in the chat. You can sign up there to receive email updates about the case. Um, in the lead up to hearing, we're also really keen to get people from across the country and also in the Pacific to share their stories of climate harm in solidarity with Uncle Paul and Uncle Pabai and to show the world what climate harms are already happening and what people are seeing in their local communities. Um, so on the Australian Climate Case website, there's a little tab called Take Action. And on there, we have our Climate Witness page. It's currently just limited to Australia only, but we'll be opening it up to the Pacific early next year. And you can see Uncle Paul and Uncle Pabai's stories on there, as well as stories of people from communities across Australia and how they're experiencing current climate harms. We're hoping to collect thousands of stories from across Australia and the Pacific as well. And we're partnering with Amnesty International Australia to do that as well. And those stories will be used to show decision makers exactly what impacts are happening right now and what people want in terms of solutions in our community. Thanks, Maria. Um, we've got a couple more questions from the audience. So to Brett. So the first one is, does Australia's obligation um, extend to Pacific Island states such as Vanuatu or is it just limited to the Torres Strait? Um, and then um, I, I'll get you to the answer this next one in legal terms. So um, it sounds like both communities, Boigu and Saibai, are experiencing some significant human rights impacts right now. Um, what's being done to address them now while the case is moving forward? So in terms of the first question, the case, um, Uncle, Uncle Pabai and Uncle Paul's case is strictly on behalf of the Torres Strait. And the, the legal argument being put forward is that because of, among other things, the Torres Strait Treaty and past legislation and actions by the Australian government, there is a very specific and special relationship between the Australian government and Torres Strait Islanders, which requires them to take action. So the duty itself would just be to the Torres Strait that we're alleging in this case. However, the good news is that if Australia takes action to help Torres Strait Islanders, it would also impact the people of Vanuatu and impact people globally and throughout the Pacific because it would mean that their emissions would decline and that decline in emissions would help everyone. Um, in terms of the second question of what's being done now, the short answer is not enough. And part of the case also goes to the actual actions being taken in the Torres Strait by the Australian government to help protect Torres Strait Islanders from the impacts they're already suffering from climate change. And um, there have been you know, horrific stories of uh, cemeteries flooding. There has been the loss of the ability to, to farm in the ways that people have before. And frankly, the Australian government's not doing enough to protect the human rights of Torres Strait Islanders. There's been some work done on seawalls, 
but not enough. And then generally across the board, simply not enough is being done. And that's that's something we're hoping that the case can also assist with. Thanks, Brett. Um, Uncle Paul, I, I don't know if you've been able to unmute yet, but please jump in if, if you have. Um, and we will be winding up soon, but I wanted to just go to Uncle um, Pabai and just ask how the community is feeling um, about the case. Um, and also just ask you, so you and Uncle Paula are going to COP soon. Um, and what, so what message did you want to share with the world at, at COP? Oh, actually, I think he's gone. Um, the internet on the islands is not very good. So, um, we might just come back to um, we might just come back to um, Maria and ask a quick question about the recent UN Human Rights Committee decision. Um, so, is there any relationship between this case and the that recent decision that came out last week? Sure. So we um, saw an excellent decision by the UN Human Rights Committee a couple of weeks ago. So that was a case brought by eight people in the Torres Strait. So it's different from Uncle Paul and Uncle Pabai's case, but I think had very similar aims in trying to hold the Australian government to account for its climate inaction. Um, so the UN Human Rights Committee handed down their decision a couple of weeks ago. They found that the Australian government had breached some key rights in relation to climate in the Torres Strait. Um, and they made recommendations in terms of what the Australian government should do as a consequence of that complaint. Um, it's a pretty significant decision in terms of international human rights law, and it's also great in that it's drawing international attention and pressure on the Australian government in terms of their lacklustre climate policy and the impact it's having on the Torres Strait, but also more broadly, the impact it's having globally on countries such as those in the Pacific as well. While they're different cases, they really are aiming to do the same thing, which is to force the Australian government to take meaningful action on climate change. So we're very happy with the win that the Torres Strait have achieved there. And Uncle Paul and Uncle Pabai um, are also very happy with that win. And we think it provides great momentum for this case to then build upon to get a domestic order from the, an Australian court about what the government must do to address climate harms. Thank you, Maria. And for anyone who'd like to stay updated about that, um, the UN committee complaint, there's a website, um, um, ourislandourhome.com.au that you can sign up for updates from as well. Um, okay, so please again, um, pop quest uh, your questions on. And we've also got Uncle Paul on loudspeaker. So he might be able to just quickly join before we wind up. Courtney, can you come off mute and um, join Uncle Paul in? Um, so welcome back, Uncle Paul. Paul, so I just, before we wind up, I wanted just to ask you um, what impact do you hope your case has for I, for communities living in the Pacific? Can you hear me that again? We can hear you. No, I can't hear you properly. Oh, sorry, we can Bill, hear you. repeating the question for Uncle Paul. Sure. So, Uncle Paul, could you tell us what you, you hope your case the impact of your case will be for the Torres Strait, but also people living in the Pacific? So, uh, this is a good, good, good question. Uh, this case, what I see is, I've been talking to a couple of elders and uh, some of the communities, and uh, to me, this case is, is not only for me and Uncle Fabai. So uh, when we had this training in Cairns, I met some of uh, the people from uh, Pacific Islands and uh, which they explained about their situation and I was here, we had spent hours here in Torres Strait. So I was in my tears just because this is how similar we, we live. And um, uh, very similar ways uh, climate change affect us. 
So what I think uh, this case will help both our neighbors and we all indigenous people of the world and all Australians if we stop this uh, gas emission and we have to give up one of the boys and it will stop. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Uncle Paul. Um, so there have been quite a few um, quite technical legal questions. Um, so for those of you who are really interested in the legal components of this case, if you go onto that website Mari mentioned, australianclimatecase.org.au, there's a section on there about the case, so you can find more detail there. And we've also attached some of the legal documents too, um, so you can have a really good look at those as well. Um, if And you can also sign up for updates on the website. If you want more information, you can always reach out um, at info at gradafund.org.au, and I'll pop that in the chat. Um, and we're very happy to answer any questions. Um, the other part as well is that um, we know that you are all campaigning really hard on climate and you've got lots of other different campaigns running. Um, as Maria mentioned, in the lead up to June next year is going to be a really important time where we're going to use the case to try and put more focus on the government and the climate harms that communities are experiencing in Australia and in the Pacific. So if you have any way that you think you would like to contribute to that or you think that the case can help raise the voices of people in the Pacific in Australia, particularly towards the government, please get in touch. Um, we've Maria's just put that email address in the chat. So it's info at gratafund, G-R-A-T-A-F-U-N-D dot org dot A-U, um, because we would really love to work together um, there. But I'll, I think we'll wind up now. We'll say thank you so much for attending this session. It's been lovely to see so many bases and to start to build relationships with you across um, the Pacific. Please um, get in touch. We'd love to hear from you, but otherwise have a wonderful day and enjoy the rest of the conference.